the articles which have been appearing in Life magazine have made a very constructive contribution to a problem that has for a long time been well out of hand. We are concerned today, as never before, with the problem of keeping the peace. And we have approached this very largely from our own perspective, which in the Western world is the perspective of economics, organization, and the development of natural resources. We have conceived of a world happy because it was well fed and well clothed. We have done very little, in general, to bridge the ideological intervals uh, which separate the peoples of the world and will keep them separate until these bridges are sufficiently strong to bear the weight of interreligious communication. Islam is one of the world's powerful religions, the last of the great religions, and with a population or a following approximating 300 million. It is scattered strategically in various parts of the world, and its very location and the areas under its influence have increased its significance in a world of modern problems. Therefore, it is very timely for us to make some attempt uh, to bridge this religious interval, which perhaps remains comparatively unrecognized in the Western world. Of all the religions of other peoples which have come under our attention, Islam has been the most neglected, perhaps because of the centuries of antagonism which have constituted a traditional legacy relating to this particular faith. This antagonism we will not attempt uh, to weigh or analyze. It belongs to the past. And like most past things, it survives in the present only among those least informed and most fanatical in their attitudes. Brilliant leadership has risen in Islam, which is no longer a world of nomads. The great motions of progress have touched the Islamic world perhaps more slowly than several other regions. But by degrees, the world of Islam is becoming a living part of a one world concept of existence. We cannot therefore continue to ignore it, nor can we continue to offend, not by intent, but by ignorance. The situation that we have today in North Africa and in the Near East is not well understood by the average person. We regret definitely the unrest, the condition of tension and stress which is affecting and afflicting peace in the Mediterranean. We see how much this unrest could contribute to a serious outbreak which might be a total disruption of world peace. Yet we do not realize how we could help to prevent uh, difficulties of this kind. In the first place, our Mediterranean basin is perhaps not as well lettered or as well educated as other parts of the non-Christian world. For example, in the newly established Kingdom of Libya, which has been carved out of the Italian colonies in North Africa, the 
the new kingdom of Libya, according to censorship, has just 13 persons in it who have graduated from high school. Now on this we have to base the nation. We have to face the problem of building into a world structure a people thus limited in educational perspective. Are we therefore to say that because the Libyans are unlettered and unschooled, that they are essentially unlearned? This may not be the case. But it does mean that their learning has not internationalized, has not bridged the intervals which divide psychologically one people from another. Their learning is still essentially a traditional religious learning, and on this they base their law. On this they build the entire structure of their national life. Thus they may be very wise in the rules and regulations of human conduct and still be unlearned as we like to think of the word. We have a similar situation, perhaps not as exaggerated, in Saudi Arabia. These people are just celebrating the arrival of their first train. Up to very recently they had no railroads. They are also beginning to face the problem of motor travel within their country. And this little nation, like uh, Yemen, another one in that region, is gradually moving from behind a mysterious curtain of aloofness into a pattern of world affairs. In Saudi Arabia, in most of the Arab states of the Near East and North Africa, the Koran is not only the religious book, it is everything, including a guide for traffic, first aid to the injured, the jury system, planting, reaping, sowing, everything is controlled and directed by the Koran. Thus, in these countries, there is no difference or interval between religious and civil law. Uh, the uh, official guide for motorists in Saudi Arabia says that if anything happens to you on the road and you do not know what to do, stop and read the Koran. That is the present order in 1955. If you have an accident, a number of devout persons versed in the Koran must form a council and find out what to do. Now, Mohammed did not give any specific instructions for motor car collisions. <laughs> Yet within the Koran, there are various moral lessons, various teachings, various precise statements about human relationship. And these must be respected and must be the basis <laughs> of decision. If there is no law governing what has happened, a law on the spot can be created and be made retroactive. Thus, it can be applied not only to you, but to what happened last month or last year, if it seems advisable to do so. To appreciate, therefore, this people and this situation, we have to recognize the powerful religious motivation that lies behind all action and all conduct. As these states grow and come forward into world affairs, they are going to grow by interpreting their sacred book, at least for the present. Later, as in most other nations, advancement in various fields will probably result in the establishment of civil law, law and civil codes. But this may be some time in arriving in a land and in a world that is completely absorbed within its own contemplations. Another very important factor in connection with Islam, which distinguishes it from most of the other religions, is its lack of internal unity. Whereas we have in Christendom a number of sects and divisions, these divisions have become powerful units in themselves, highly organized and a small group 
of powerful sects dominate the Christian world. This degree of domination is not present in Islam. For a number of years, Muslim leaders have been striving desperately to create a pan-Islamic situation in which the various separate uh, parts of that religion could be brought together under some general council or under some general agreement. Not necessarily that the uh, religion should be brought under one spiritual head, <coughs> but rather that it might be directed to one spiritual or temporal goal in its effects upon the lives of its people. This has not been successful at the present time. And while the faith is one, it functions through a series of separate, non-unified groups. In other words, Islam has never had its Council of Nicaea. It has never had any of the great councils like those of Ahsoka in India. Councils that brought together and unified the structure of this faith. It functions very largely scattered over a vast area with very little communication and uh, almost no uh, impulse or incentive uh, toward uni unifying its various branches. You might wonder then that a religion so scattered and so diversified would occupy a prominent place in world affairs. Perhaps the answer of this lies in the fact that Islam is a dynamic religion. It is a religion of action. It is a positive religion. It is a religion which does not remain in the background to gather up the scattered wreckage of other social structures, but leads in every branch of Muslim life. It is therefore a constantly moving faith. It has never fallen into a real stasis for the fact that it has never entered a secondary place in the life of its people. It is still dominant. It is still on every man's tongue. And it has fought for and retained this dominance over a long period of time. It has led, directed, moved. Another interesting phase of Islamic thought, which perhaps is one of the contributions that Islam could make to world thinking, is the peculiar duty of the religious person in Islam. Uh, the Muslims do not have the same type of clergy that we have. Rather, their preachers are essentially teachers. And most of the brilliant Muslim religious leaders have schools in which they teach both sacred and secular subjects. Thus, in the Muslim world, the preacher is teacher. Reaching out from the basis of the Koran and its interpretations into the whole field of society. And to the Muslim religious leader, Reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion are all the same thing. They are part of one structure. As the result of most of education being dominated by the religious, we find no conflict between sacred and profane learning, as we may find it in other nations, and no conflicts between so-called science and the authority of the Koran. Islamism presents a peculiar challenge to Christianity because it is one of the three religions to which the term pagan or heathen cannot be applied according to Webster's International Unabridged Dictionary. Muslimism is not a heathen religion. Why is it not a heathen religion? Why is it not a pagan religion? Because three faiths are rooted in the same religious tradition. These faiths are Judaism, Christianity, and Muslimism. They are all based upon the authority of the Old Testament. Thus they spring from one basic religious source, and as such present a peculiarly difficult situation. 
This difficult situation is nowhere better demonstrated than in the city of Jerusalem, which of course is a sacred center for three of the world's living religions. These religions, therefore, in their conflict over the possession of the areas around the Holy Land, are motivated or inspired to a degree at least by the peculiar sanctity of this location to their own faiths. It would be very easy, therefore, for a serious and terrible holy war to break out in the Near East because of the pressure of these religious factors. Christendom probably will take little part in such a holy war as such because the Christian world fought its holy war with Islam at the time of the Crusades, and having come out of the Crusades second best, has decided to retire from active conflict. Today, the Western world no longer would probably be sufficiently motivated by theological pressures to engage in a war in the Holy Land over any religious problem. Gradually, the traditional life of Christianity has moved from historical geographical foundations to very largely ideological, mystical, and symbolical foundations. But this is not necessarily true of the other groups that are struggling in the area of the Holy Land. Jerusalem is sacred to the Muslim world because it was the first great center of their faith. While the prophet Muhammad was alive, the faithful turned to Jerusalem for a prayer. And it was only later that the faithful were taught to turn to Mecca. Jerusalem was also early associated with the mystical tradition in Islam. And the pre present site or the site of Solomon's temple, or at least the great temple of Herod, is now occupied by a Muslim mosque. Gordon's Calvary is a Muslim cemetery. And the Muslim world has very largely controlled this area for a very long time. It is obvious also that Jerusalem is the great center of the spiritual pilgrimage of Israel. And the Israelis are fighting for the most sacred land or ground of their faiths. And in their expansion, there is no doubt that the Arab world is confronted with a serious dilemma. A dilemma which is very real and very deep because of the religious overtones. The Arab is a nomadic individual. He is not a person who is by nature an industrialist. He does not uh, much consider the problems of economic integration. He is grateful unto Allah for the fact that he has just had a great deal of oil discovered on his land and is a rich man without labor. <coughs> These things are from the blessings of God. But when it comes to building factories, opening plants and industries, the Arab is quite a ways yet from that viewpoint in his own basic thinking. On the other hand, the little state of Israel rising in this area is well acquainted with Western methods of operation. Uh, emigration into the area is continuing at a very large and rapid rate. And it is only a matter of time before this little sliver of land is going to be utterly inadequate for a rising state, which is drawing its means and its population from many parts of the world and will in due course be confronted with its own birth rate. This means to the Arab that there is likely to be and almost inevitably will be further encroachment upon the land patterns of the time. The cities of Medina and Mecca are not very far from Israel. These are the very hearts of the uh, entire Islamic world. And this encroachment within this area is bound to be faced with grave alarm by Muslim leaders who are resolved to protect and preserve the holy places of their faith. 
Here religion, therefore, is coming to become the cause or the source once more of the gravest difficulties for mankind. The only answer must lie where it has always been, in the increase of religious understanding and the recognition by all men in common that we cannot serve God by destroying each other. This discovery, this revelation, is still not generally agreed upon by the religious leaders and even the peoples of the world. For the leaders are all sustained and supported by a vast amount of personal prejudice. The prejudice of the private citizen makes possible the aggressive and destructive attitudes of leaders. And were it not for the intolerance within the hearts of the majority, the minority could not become so aggressively militant. So what Islam promises to play a very important part in world affairs, particularly in the next 10 or 15 years. And unless something is done to solve the mystery, which separates human beings who wish to serve the one principle of truth in the universe, unless something is done to help this situation, we may find again cru uh, uh, truth crucified between the extremes of fanaticism and bigotry. To rescue this means thoughtfulness, and it means also that each citizen of any nation can make a valid contribution by simply gradually educating his own nature out of intolerance and recognizing the sublime and supreme right of human beings uh, to have their own religious convictions. Now we will never solve these problems merely on the levels of the problems themselves. We must always solve by transcending Solution lies not in struggling on a level, but on lifting the consciousness and the soul to a higher level, that it may experience or recognize unities. Always when we are bigger than problems, we solve them because we can fit them into their parts and places. When problems are bigger than we are, it means that we have never seen through them or found or experienced or discovered a reality within them by which they are brought into harmony with other aspects of an identical reality. It is amazing that the world has reached its present degree of general knowledge that Western man and to a great degree now Eastern man has come so far as has been achieved to date <coughs> without a greater recognition or realization on the religious level. Probably the answer lies in the emotional content of human nature and in the peculiar sense of loyalty which we feel on religious subjects. We are perfectly willing to discuss almost anything tolerantly except our religion. We feel that to give in any degree to compromise any point of sectarian doctrine is in some way to betray God. Therefore our devotion is expressed by a wholehearted refusal to change any jot or tittle of an ideology, no matter where it has come from or how ineffective it has proven to be. This loyalty Loyalty perhaps to words rather than to ideas. The substitution of creedal denominations or creedal statements for the total statement of faith has resulted in the division of men who are divided and broken by ideas which are not different but only seem to be until the individual reaches a point where his religion has impelled him to thoughtfulness and not merely demanded of him a physical, literal allegiance. Now this problem of literal allegiance 
is probably one of our main difficulties. It is not that we ask or expect or hope that anyone should be false to his doctrines, but perhaps we can discover in some way that the individual who is intolerant on a religious level is false to truth itself, is false to reality itself, and therefore in being thus in a way is detrimental or improper in attitude toward all religions and all faiths. This situation is crying desperately for thoughtfulness and is asking us to recognize that we are living in the 20th century, a century in which we should know that the difference between Allah and God is almost completely a matter of spelling and pronunciation and not a matter of idea. But we are completely blocked by idea. An individual who worships God is a good, proper person. But an individual who worships Brahma is a heathen. And yet what does the word mean? What is behind words? The moment we think of these words, we think of religious structures. When we think of Brahma, we think of Hinduism. And begin to imagine all kinds of ways in which Hindus are different from us. When we think of the Muslim world, when we think of Allah, we think of another religion with its structures, with its mosques, with its fast days and its feast days. And we always, of course, if possible, remember the Crusades. Just as today in world relationships, internationally, we are still fighting the Revolutionary War with the British Empire and we are still fighting internally the civil war between the North and South. These old feuds die hard, and the long struggles of religion die hard. Perhaps one of the reasons why we have had less difficulty with Far Eastern faiths than we have with these Middle Eastern is because all through the time when we were very mad at everyone except ourselves, we did not know that these Far Eastern religions existed. Therefore, we didn't bother to dislike them. If we had known more about them, we probably would have had feuds with them also. But they were too remote. They did not touch our way of life down through the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 10th centuries and through those long dark ages in the early medieval world. We had comparatively little contact with Far Asia. Therefore, their religions were never too dramatically uh, in conflict with us. But Islam was on the borders of our own Christendom. The Muslim hordes moved against Europe. The Holy Land fell to them. The Crusades failed to release the Holy Land. And for centuries, the Muslim world stood as a menacing antichrist, standing firmly and strongly behind the walls of Gog and Magog, threatening the whole civilized universe. Therefore, we got very unhappy over the whole thing. Yet when difficulties came along, for instance, uh, when the Greek academies and the Roman schools uh, could no longer function because of the decadence of the Greek or Roman Empire, Scholars went to Arabia, and it was in Arabia that they found hospitality and peace. Refugees, intellectuals particularly, from Europe, found in Arabia a golden land of liberal thinking and liberal opportunity. Even the Crusaders found that the Saracen was not the fire-belching dragon they had imagined, but a very cultured people and that Saladin was not only a powerful adversary, but a very generous and chivalrous foe. <laughs> so gradually, a good deal of the rough edge was taken off, but it remained pretty powerful theologically all the way down to the 19th century. And as late as the close of the last centuries, the last century, a small Muslim mission in one of our American cities was burned, and its followers stoned for creating a heathen faith in America. 
we have not yet outgrown these unhappy situations. And it particularly annoys us to feel that some other religion has to send missionaries over here to save us. <laughs> and yet, I don't question and I know that there are some very pious people belonging to other faiths who figure that somebody should get over here and save us some way, and that they are willing to offer themselves as martyrs to the cause. We see things in a different light, but if we could see things in a broad, impersonal light, we would gain a great deal from the experience. Knowing, therefore, that we must live in a world of which a part of the population is Muslim, and recognizing that we live in a world in which five or six great religious motions are contemporarily powerful, and that these motions, contrary to the expectation of our forebears, are not going to disappear. They are not going to dissolve into thin air because we want them to. Nor are we going to succeed in converting all these people. We will not convert them for several reasons, one of which is that they believe what they believe and think they are right, and the second thing is we are not setting the kind of an example that is likely to convert anybody. These two powerful points preclude the probability that we are simply going to be able to proselyte our way to religious unity. We are not. We are going to have to face the probability that the future will give us, ultimately, a new religion, a religion brought out of the great melting pot, the alchemical vessel or retort of existing faiths, and that we are going to finally recognize the need for a world religion. And we are going to realize that this cannot be accomplished by imposing one faith upon another, but that through the union of faith, the great universality of the principle of truth may be given a new statement, a new and powerful re revelation in which all that has been accomplished that is good by all faiths will be preserved, that man will be relieved of the, the misfortune, public and private, of religious, at theological and sectarian strife. We must have this. We need it, and we must begin to build toward it. Even more than we have needed uh, United Nations, we have needed United Religion. And the, one of the great weaknesses of the United Nations lies in its inability to touch the ideological levels of human life. Now, in our Western life, these levels are comparatively secondary and have caused us to assume that such is true in other nations, but it is not true. And for the greater part of the civilized and uncivilized worlds today, the need for a, a concept of religious dedication to principles of peace, equity, and fraternity, this realization is of the gravest importance. Religions themselves are recognizing and in various parts of the world, pan-religious movements are in operation. Religious conferences and congresses are being held in different parts of Asia particularly, in an effort to unite this vast area in religious understanding, not to take men's faith away from them, but to make possible that the members of different faiths shall abide in friendliness and concord together, and shall not devote their energy and time to the righteous warfare against their neighbors. These movements are having considerable influence, and this influence is increasing. And the increase of this influence is a very good sign that we will ultimately be able to have a great unified league, a league of religions, in which all of the spiritual power and resource of faith will be devoted and dedicated to the achievement of the love and worship of one God and the service of one humanity. This concept is acceptable by all the religions of the world.
And if we had thrown our emphasis upon this acceptance of great principles instead of division over small details, we would long ago have achieved religious unity and have had the great moral power of religion working for peace instead of merely being able to send its priests and its religious personalities to battle with their armies to give consolation to the dying. We are in much more real need of religion than this. It should prevent war rather than to uh, only bind up the wounds of public or private strife. Now what are the essential tenets of Islam? Uh, which can be bridges between their world and ours? Do they worship a different kind of God? I think the nearest answer, perhaps the most practical solution that we have to that, is to say that the Muslim world in general worships a concept of God, which is very much the concept of the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. Essentially, the Muslim concept of God is the concept of the Pentateuch, uh, the five books attributed to the prophet Moses. Therefore, we have in uh, the orthodox Muslim world the concept of a strong God, a racial deity, a God who has a chosen people. In this case, the chosen people is Islam. These people, however, have been divided clearly from the beginning of their history, even from the time of the prophet himself, into two essential groups, one being what might be termed the literal worshippers, those who follow letter by letter the various statutes of the covenant. But there has always been in Islam a large group of mystics, resulting inevitably from the general temperament of the people. For Islam is not essentially a scientific world. It is a world of glamour, a world of strong emotions, a world which achieves its compassion through the experience of its passion, a world which has found religion uh, through the tremendous intensity of its human emotions. Thus we have in this case a people mystically inclined, devoted to the realization that there could be and must be a deeper, more intensely personal, even universal meaning behind the concepts of religion. So early in the development of Islam, the mystics became important. Mystic sects like the dervishes have always played a large part in the life of the people. Mysticism in Islam was much closer to the surface than it was in Judaism or has been in Christianity. In the um, mysticism of Islam, therefore, we have more and more emphasis upon the nature of deity as consciousness, as an experience, as a mystical power. This has gradually taken over a large part of Muslim religious speculation. Until today, although Islam does have the God of Jacob and the God of Isaac, at the same time, it has a strange and deep mysticism, a kind of Kabbalism, like that which rose in Israel, by which these literal terms are given a much deeper and more vital significance. One point that stands, of course, prominently in the entire concept, is the absolute monotheism of Islam. In Islam, there is no God but God. And Muhammad is the prophet of God. Islam has saved itself one very difficult situation. It was never torn into shreds, as Christianity was, over the possibility of identifying as co-eternal and unbegotten, the three persons of the Trinity. Thousands died and were martyred and murdered in the effort to determine whether the Trinity was one person in three or three persons in one. 
That could not happen in the Muslim world. The poor Arab was far too practical a man to engage in that kind of thinking. So he solved his problem very simply. He solved it upon the clear and definite statement that at the root of life is a sovereign and absolute unity. And this unity he has variously come to understand. And we must not forget that the rise of Islam following nearly 600 years after the rise of Christianity, followed also the rise of a number of sects in North Africa, the Near East, and even in the Roman Empire, which were to profoundly affect also the descent of Christianity. Muslimism is not only a religion of Arabia, but it is a gradual gathering together of many different religious beliefs. It includes strong Neoplatonic aspects, was involved in Gnosticism, was considerably influenced by the heresy of Manes, was influenced by all of the Greek and Platonic and Aristotelian groups, and also was considerably influenced by the religions of ancient Persia. All of these religions contributed something. Uh, to that mysterious polyglot which was gradually to emerge as Islam. Like all religions, Islam was not born like Minerva, full grown from the head of Zeus. It was a process of the gradual integration of cults and faiths, mingling in their common stream the ancient pre-Muslim Sabianism of the region. So in uh, the uh, concept of God, the Muslim really borrowed in substance from a great many sources. I discussed this problem at one time with the presiding Muslim leader in the Jumna Masjid at Delhi in India. And we discussed this problem of the difference between the concept of God in Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And with a typical Eastern gesture of dismissal, this wonderful, venerable old gentleman said quietly, we know there is no difference. But we also know that because of the tremendous strength of tradition in our various areas that we cannot even convince our own followers of this. Our followers are too set and seated in their own opinions. And he told me, he said, every Muslim leader is at the present time profoundly concerned with the recognition of the need for religious and interreligious unity. But we cannot work with our peoples. We can only proceed slowly, because if we go against them, we merely destroy ourselves. We do not help them. And if we, are, if we permit ourselves as leaders of vision to be periodically destroyed, then finally the faiths themselves will fall into the keeping of such narrowed and unintelligent persons that leadership is impossible. Therefore it is necessary for us to proceed slowly, but always with this end in mind, to realize that the intelligent Muslim is just as aware as the intelligent member of any faith, not only of the basic unity of religion, but also of the desperate need for religious unity on a political level. This type of thinking uh, we have to face. They are having to face it. And uh, their difficulties are largely increased, we are sorry to say, by their contact with the non-Muslim world. The very poor management of the great colonial empire of France and the equally poor management of the colonial empire of Italy has done a great deal to damage internationalism between uh, the Arabic and the Christian worlds. The unfortunate tendency to proselyte, and more than that, to exploit the resources of these countries, these tendencies have caused great damage to our hope of better understanding, because the majority of the people, the common people, uh, cannot admire, respect, or cooperate with that which is definitely injuring them. 
We cannot ask that much of human nature. The Muslim concept of God being a total unity, we have in this concept, as we find it set forth in the Koran, also, however, a, a poetic overtone that is not to be found in the Pentateuch. And that poetic overtone is this recognition of totality as having its face everywhere and its substance and distribution in everything. Thus the prophet points out that this one deity is to be seen in the sunrise and to be seen in the sunset. That it is blazing forth in the glory of the sun at high noon. And it is also hidden deep within the mysteries of the earth. This one deity, this one reality, is one in everything and everything in one. The recognition of this total oneness if it is not disfigured in some way, is a wonderful and powerful aid to religious unity. For all peoples, under some form or some name, have a concept of total divinity. They may call it either a total being or person, or they may to uh, consider it a total state of consciousness, or a total existence. But on the level of the definition of first cause or ultimate root, there is really very little religious difference. All these peoples could get together on that concept and by a very minor adjustment of interpretation alone uh, could at least come to a friendliness about it. One might say that uh, the Eternal has a more mental nature, and another might say that it has a more mystical nature, but that it has a nature, being, or existence, and that this is supreme, they would have in common. Now, the monotheism of Islam came in direct conflict with Christianity over the problem of the prophet. To the Christian world, Muhammad, of course, was little better than an antichrist. But to the Muslim world, the position of the prophet in the world affairs shows a definite influence from Asia, whereas ours does not show so definite a borrowing. To the Muslim, Mohammed, the prophet, must be and always shall remain a human being. The Muslim world has not accepted any intermediary in the form of the God-man or the man-God between divinity and nature. This does not mean that the Muslim world does not populate this interval, for in its mystical speculations it has a space that is filled with beings, visible and invisible. But on the level of its prophets, Islam insists that God is God, and man is man, and that the prophet is a man. Mohammed placed this injunction with the greatest severity upon the people himself, perhaps as a revulsion from the difficulties which he had learned of as existing in the early councils of the church. Christianity at that time was terribly divided on the subject of the relation of Jesus to God and the tremendous difficulties and the intolerances and the persecutions waged over this during the time of Muhammad may very well have influenced him through his knowledge and acquaintance with the Nestorian church which had fled into the desert to escape destruction. But in the event, Muhammad made this point very, very clear that perhaps it was true that he had certain uh, authority, authority given to him by God, but that this authority was limited and restricted, and that at no time was he to be regarded as an object of personal worship. At no time was he re to be regarded as an intercessor between God and man. He was a teacher. He was a man who had had an experience of God within himself 
an experience which all men might have. He was one of a descent of prophets, and he was the first of his own uh, religion in the term of prophets. All of the other prophets, Mohammed is the seventh recognized in Islam, all of the others were either Jewish or Jesus, who was the sixth prophet according to Islam. In the Koran it states definitely that anyone who does not believe that Jesus, the son of Mary, was a prophet sent by God. Such a one cannot enter the Muslim paradise. So uh, this again gives us a little ground for thought, but ground that we don't use very often. We recognize only the concept that in their own faith, Muhammad has been elevated to a superior place, and therefore we can have nothing to do with any part of it. Here again, we are not... Uh, thinking very straight, because we are overlooking uh, a very important thing, that in Islam, yes, uh, Muhammad was a later prophet, but according to Islam, Muhammad and Jesus were both human beings, and Muhammad takes no divine precedence. According to uh, Muslimism, prophets are human beings raised up by their own piety to love and serve and sacrifice for their fellow men. The teacher, therefore, must suffer with the people he teaches. He has no peculiar authority. He has no sphere of power other than that which is given to him by those who understand him and love him. He has no wisdom beyond the wisdom of his fellow men except the voice of God speaking in his heart. He is not safe against any evils of men. For the Muslim world took the attitude that if a prophet is the son of God and descends only in appearance to serve men, then the life, the suffering, the death of that prophet must all be illusion because God cannot suffer. Or if God can suffer, he must know the survival of himself. Where a man with nothing but his own faith, and depending totally on that faith, can suffer, can die, and can be victorious over death by his own faith alone. And in so doing, he fulfills the archetype of the enlightened religious human being. If, in the words of the Islamic commentator, if Jesus was a man, then his example is the noblest that man can follow. But if Jesus is not a man, if he is a God, and thereby hopelessly divided from man, then his example can no longer inspire men because men cannot be God as he was. That is the Islamic approach to the subject. So the prophet was not helped or saved by God. He was not placed in a unique position. He was simply a person who greatly loved his people and who desired to serve them, and who in his own heart had an experience, an experience of the desperate need of man. And in his own heart and soul he rebelled against the corruptions of Mecca. He knew that people came from all over the world, the Muslim world, or the pre-Muslim world to be exact, to worship at the ancient sanctuary, which was later to be rededicated as the Kaaba at Mecca. Here merchants filched their goods, here highwaymen slew them, here hotel keepers raised their fares and their charges so as to take every cent the faithful had. Mohammed did not believe in this. He did not believe that a city should be a great religious center of exploitation, causing the faithful to be cheated and treated as gullible children because in their hearts they sought to serve God and truth. So he resolved upon a reformation of his own people. And when this burden of thought heavily descended upon his soul, he went to Mount Hira, and there he remained fasting and praying, asking not that a new religion should be given to him, because Muhammad, like most world leaders, had no concept of a new religion any more than apparently the first 
uh, disciples of Jesus had any concept of a new religion. They were seeking a powerful and constructive reform. As Jesus himself said, he came to fulfill the prophets and not to destroy the prophets. The, the same was true of Muhammad. He came to fulfill, not to destroy. And as he knelt in prayer, he begged, not for a new religion, but that the original religion of the patriarchs, the first and a natural religion of mankind as revealed to Jacob and Isaac, that he might be again brought into an understanding of this, that he could teach his people the one true religion that has already always existed. And it is in these prayers and meditations that he is said to have received the visions which were to be the basis of the Islamic world. As always, these prophets were moved by some mystical revelation or experience within themselves. And here on Mount Hira, Mohammed beheld the vision of the angel Jeboriel, bearing upon its arms the scarves or silken shawls in which in blazing letters appeared in living fire the surahs of the Koran or verses or sections of it. Now the interesting thing that Muhammad himself tells us is that when these blazing inscriptions appeared upon the shawls Muhammad bowed his head in humility. He could not read or write. Whereupon the angel caused him to find or discover in his own mind the meaning of the words. So that the words mysteriously turned to life in him. He was not a learned man. Learning was not the habit of his time in the region from which he came. He was a distinguished man. A wealthy citizen. A man who had everything to lose and nothing to gain. A man who renounced wealth and honor and position to become an outlaw and a beggar. This beginning of Islam, then, has an interesting statement in it, and something that, again, is a message perhaps for us out here in the Western world, and that is the first converts to the faith of Islam were the family of the Prophet. He was not without honor in his own family. So often, it is someone else who knows us less that is more easily converted. But the sincerity of the man, the devotion of his life, the integrity of him as a person was known to those nearest to him, and they were the first to recognize him. This would strongly suggest that he was not a deceiver or by intent an evil person with some selfish or ulterior desire. The circumstances of the revelation of the Koran have been subjected to a great deal of psychological analysis. Out of all of these circumstances, there comes one thing which is probably about as near the truth as anything that we will ever have. Muhammad certainly and definitely had a mystical experience. And in the later revelation of his work, he uh, dictated the larger part of the Koran, while under a kind of trance. This trance appeared first, or the symptoms of it, were terrific chills and sweating, and wrapped in a blanket with uh, sweat pouring from his body in a state of convulsion. He would dictate these verses in such great physical agony uh, that uh, it was recorded and noted at the time of his tremendous suffering. And later, when one of his followers pointed to the gray, beard, the gray hairs in the beard of the teacher and asked the meaning of the gray hairs, Mohammed said that each of those gray hairs is a surah of the Koran, given in great pain, in great tribulation. That these uh, efforts were sincere, we cannot doubt. Whether it is true that the man was epileptic, we do not know. Epilepsy has often been called the divine disease, but in among ancient peoples it covered many kinds of strange excitations of the nervous or psychic system. In any event, he was tremendously and intensely dominated 
by the one pointed resolution to do something to rescue his people uh, from the darkness of superstition and ignorance. That he fought this fight well until he finally died as the result of poison, we know. That he died a martyr essentially to his beliefs and that his last years were filled with pain because of this effort to poison him. We also know. We know furthermore that throughout life, as Carlyle so well points out to us, that Muhammad retained always the greatest simplicity of person. He walked and worked with his people. He dressed the same as they did. He made his own shoes, and some say that he wove the cloth for his own clothes. He was a very simple, unlettered man with a tremendous devotion that communicated itself to others so that he became a very powerful leader of a small heretical sect which survived as most newborn faiths have survived, largely because of the goodness of providence. On several occasions, the entire faith could have been completely wiped out, but it was not. We know also uh, the pain and misery of the man at the death of his little son, Ibrahim. We know how he knelt and wept as a heartbroken father. And when others came to him and asked him uh, why he wept, knowing as he did what he knew, and having the friendship of God, he replied very simply that a man could have the friendship of God and know many things. But if that man was a father, he would weep when his son died. These very simple things about the man stand out. One occasion, a number of his enemies attempted to uh, reach his place of refuge and the, and, the, and the prophet resting under a tree asleep woke suddenly to find a soldier of the gods of Mecca standing over him with a drawn sword ready to kill him. And the, sword, the, sir, the soldier taunted him and said to him, and now, with this sword hanging over your head, in what will you put your faith? And the prophet said very quietly, without moving, as I always have, in the one eternal God. The soldier stood for a moment, then dropped the sword, and was one of the early converts to Islam. Now, a man of this nature is not an evil man. He is not a terrible monster. He is not the creator of a false faith. That his faith may have been, his religion may have been, the psychological extension and expansion of his own consciousness is quite possible. But shall we say different from most faiths? For whenever a stream of ideals flow through a human being, they are bound to be influenced by the nature and character of that being. We are different. And it is this difference which very often marks religions and causes us to lose sight of the fact that we are mistaking the channel for the stream that moves through it. Another important point, I think, in connection with the story of, of Islam and what it means to our modern world today, is that Islam gives us a picture, which perhaps we need more than we realize, of the importance of the mingling of religious and uh, industrial and economic values in a way of life. If you have ever been in a Persian rug market or on any of the little streets of Baghdad or perhaps in any in Muslim community in India or North Africa and been in the very process of buying something, supposing you are getting ready to buy a very fine rug, now, of course, the merchant has double, triple, quadrupled the price, uh, which is permitted because, of course, you are an unbeliever anyway, <laughs> which is very convenient. This part of the religious policy can be recognized everywhere and, incidentally, might also be a good common ground. But <laughs> in the midst of this comes something that is not common ground. The priest, high in the minaret, calls the faithful to prayer. Now, this is a bad moment. 
You have just told the rug merchant that you are very likely to buy the rug. In fact, you're reaching your hand into your pocket to get the money. Comes the call to prayer. Ninety-nine out of every hundred Western merchants would finish the transaction and be a minute or two late to prayers, but not the Muslim. Perhaps with one part of his consciousness fixed on God and a small fragment of it clinging to the rug transaction, he will still spread his prayer rug, face Mecca, and enter prayer. If he loses the sale, it is too bad. If he loses his soul, it is much worse. There is a peculiar relevancy here. That to these people, in most of their transactions, religion plays a larger part than it does with us. We go along from month in to month out with perhaps only an occasional interlude in which religion dominates our conduct. We talk about it, uh, we analyze it, we hear about it, we read about it. But in critical moments it seldom intrudes itself into the transaction of our material affairs. Thus we have gradually separated religion from the practical side of life. And as the practical side, without some kind of color, religious or otherwise, gradually gets to be terribly boresome, we do become very neurotic from the lack of emotional content in daily life. The um, Easterner has emotional content in bargaining and in all the things that he does. He carries with him a great deal of color. He could not imagine anything more dismal than sitting at a desk all day long, working with widgets and wadgets. He couldn't do it. He has to have color in his life. And religion gives him a constant stream of emotional activity. As a result of it, he finds satisfaction in other things other than profit. He thinks in terms of the pleasure of what he is doing. Because his personal life, his work, his policies, his attitudes, his interests are all one package. He isn't rushing from one thing to another. He isn't sorry that he's working because he wants to play. He makes his work and his play very much alike. And he covers them both with the golden aura of his religious devotions. This vitality is very important and is something we have deprived ourselves of by our matter-of-fact, prosaic approach to nearly everything that we call practical living. Now, in the Muslim world, and in many other ancient worlds also, there is a very close relationship between religion and the physical practices of living. This, I think, is important. We have lost track of a great deal of it. In the great Muslim feasts and fasts of Ramadan, for example, and the pilgrimage to Mecca, and all these observances which make up the Muslim life, we find, as in most ancient religions, that the religious laws help to regulate the conduct of material affairs. We find, for example, uh, fasting which is a religious virtue, but which within certain boundaries and under reasonable emotional religious direction is also a very important hygienic measure. Your Mosaic law, your Muslim law, and most of your ancient Asiatic laws are not only religious observances, but they are practical courses of conduct inspiring to moderation to very basic attainment on the level of health. These people, therefore, derive their medicine from their religion. They derive their psychology and their psychiatric health from their religion. And it is so constantly part of them, and its injunctions are so final, that these autocorrective religious instincts have helped to preserve these people through a great many disasters. We are totally lacking in them and are now required to find only scientific help which does not have the same authority and is not 
uh, not obeyed with the same certainty, vitality, and sense of integrity. In the Muslim world also, there the desire, the hope, the dream of the coming world teacher is a very important thing. The Muslim world joins with the Jewish world in the conviction that the Messiah is yet to come. But the old Muslim mystics, particularly the dervishes, have a very interesting doctrine about the Messiah. This mysterious being which the Muslim calls Ahmed, the desired of all nations. This coming prophet who wings with him the golden age. This prophet is not the return of a god, but the arising of a man. Now in the secret teachings of Islam, as they were communicated to the initiates of their sects, this man, this prophet Ahmed, who is to come, is the redeemed Adam. This same concept also holds true in certain Christian sects, and could be explored philosophically and idealistically with considerable advantage. The word Adam, of course, in the original letters, as we find it in the opening chapters of Genesis, the three Hebrew letters, A-D-M, literally means a species, a kind. And the Adam is the platonic archetype of collective mankind. In other words, the first man was collective humanity, and Ahmed, the desired of all nations, the Messiah who must ultimately come, is the divinely enlightened human collective itself. Not a person, but again a totality. Because the only thing, or the only prophet that can bring peace to all men is that prophet which is in the heart of all men. And until men together find peace, peace cannot come. Until mankind finds consolation and comfort, the Holy Spirit, which is the Comforter, cannot come. Therefore, Ahmed, the prophet to come, the ultimate always, the Maitreya of the northern uh, Tibetan school, is always the ever-coming integrity in man himself. Now, some Muslims certainly will consider Ahmed as being a person, a prophet, who will walk upon a hair stretched from the wall of Jerusalem uh, to the Mount of Olives, an old tradition. They will consider this very literally and very exactly. But this is true in all faiths upon a certain level, and we are just as guilty of this practice as any other religion is. But to those who are seeking the inner light, or seeking the greater light, the desire of all nations is the great collective of mankind. Now, in this pattern, the concept of Mohammed himself appears because it is Mohammed who is said to have been the prophet. He is the man among men who made a bid, who stood a witness to the basic good in all men. The message of Mohammed to the dervish is that as Mohammed was human, and being human and frail and subject to all limitations of the flesh, that he rose to this degree of integrity, that he devoted and dedicated himself utterly and completely to the service of God and his people, that this is a testimony, this is an evidence that the seed of the divine nature is in all human beings, and that just as the black uh, spot of original sin was taken out of, Mo, of, out of the heart of Mohammed by the angel Jeboreel. So in each human being, original sin is cleansed by dedication. Therefore, what Mohammed has done is a promise of what all men may do. And Islamists go so far as to point out that the great lawmaker, the good prince, the great scientist, the great poet and mystic, all persons in all walks of life who rising up out of their own smallness and their own selfishness 
and uh, become servants of a principle within their own hearts, the principle that tells them to live straight and to serve well. But wherever these persons arise, and by their dedication, consecration, and sacrifice, advance the cause of mankind, they in turn bear witness to the prophet. They are proving that others can do as he has done, in his name or in his likeness, and that these, these others may in their turn achieve, proves that there is within each human soul that breath of life which the great deity breathed into man and caused him to become a living being, and that this breath of life in him is his redeemer, and that this breath of life is his ever-present savior. We find this moving very close to the concept of St. Paul, the Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. Uh, to the Muslim, it is the God in man. There is no intermediary, but it is the divine in man which makes man capable of being divine. And in this divinity, he releases his own true life. Not because he is a God, he is a frail, earthy creature, but because the God in him can be reborn and escape into its own eternity. A man as a being and as a person is a servant of this divine power moving through him. When this power moves triumphantly through the greater bodies of mankind until human beings begin to live from within themselves the doctrine of universal brotherhood and recognize the fatherhood of God, then in those days comes the golden time. In those days heaven comes to earth. And in that time there rises up the Messiah, the beloved of all nations, which is the universal good, rising triumphantly, resurrected from the darkness of mortality and death. This concept, which may be slightly different from our own, is not, however, so utterly and completely uh, beyond our understanding that we cannot say this. Regardless of whether we believe in a messianic dispensation by which we are foreordained and predestined to salvation, whether we believe this or believe in the Muslim way, I think we can definitely say that any good thing to come, whether it is the second advent or whether it is the release of a power within ourselves, that any good thing to come is made more reasonable and likely by merit. And that therefore, if we are good Muslims or good Christians, we should still have the instinct to build a better world from within ourselves and give it to humanity as a treasure and a heritage to have and to hold until the great day shall come. There is no reason why the individual, regardless of his faith, should not accept the challenge that the world that we want, we should build. And that if we desire a world of peace ruled over by wisdom, truth, and God, then we should dedicate our efforts to attain that end. And should not hope or believe that a dispensation imposed upon us by God is a substitute or an equivalent for our own conscientious efforts to grow. No religion would tell the individual that he will be a better person by doing nothing. Uh, he must try to make the kind of personal adjustment by which he is a credit to his faith or he has no place in any religion of importance in the world. So this concept of the ever-coming Messiah, the truth that is finally consummated in the collective body of man, the restored, resurrected, and redeemed Adam, is, I think, worth a little thought as a possible ground upon which to build the hope of a world religious unity, and also something that would do well for us to think about, namely that perhaps collective humanity is to become the embodiment of the divine being that is to come for the redemption of the world. There have been many legends, fables, and myths about these things, and they are all more or less in the same definite spirit.
One other point about the Muslim faith that could be important, perhaps it isn't as well kept as it should, but in many ways I think it is better kept than we have a tendency to keep it, and that is the entry of Muslim religion as a force into the private life of the citizen, in his home, and in his personal affairs. Dominantly and definitely, the Muslim believes that your religion should be lived in your home, that it should dominate your relationships with people. And again, the example of the prophet is very important, not because the prophet is God, but because the prophet is good, and because those who do as he did are themselves to be considered good. And the examples of the prophet, whether they be historical or traditional, include a very contrite and very reverent attitude toward uh, the consummation of all of the personal problems of life. Gentle, kindly, understandable relationships between husband and wife, parent and child, between the family and its neighbor, and these things, so that religion becomes strongly and powerfully daily practice, not daily precept. The precept is useless unless it leads to practice. Therefore, in the Muslim home, uh, the life of the prophet becomes an example of a well-ordered home, a home in which there is peace, uh, security, tranquility, and I have noted in traveling in many parts of the world that whether it is in Japan, in the Shinto, a Buddhist faith, or in the Confucian or Taoist home of China, or in the Hindu, a Buddhist home of Central Asia, or in the Muslim home, that in practically all home life in the Eastern Hemisphere, there is an entirely different attitude from the one that we have here. There is no other part of the world in which Domestic disruptions are as powerful, dominant, and continuous as they are here. Nor is there any other religion in which the relationship of parent, child, husband, and wife uh, are, is taken so loosely and with so little consideration of values. Now, it isn't due to the fact that something sits like a lid upon these homes. They are not dowerful miserable place, their walls hung with 19th century theological mottos, or anything of that nature. It is simply a recognition of certain niceness, certain fineness in human relationships, a fineness which has its root in the spiritual conviction of the people of not only what is good and bad, but what is beautiful. And the continuity of worship in the form of religion entering into daily transaction it is important. We've lost it almost totally. And in that loss, we have not gained. And we have not gained in the complete loss of the recognition of what constitutes acceptable relationships. Now, Muslimism is a very practical religion. It perhaps lacks some of the overtones that we are most acquainted with. But Muslimism and Judaism combine in another very essential point, namely that experience is the source of religious law. Man-made laws can be made by a group of persons around a table, but the laws of the scriptures are nearly all of them thousands of years old, traditionally held for ages before they were put in written form and for the most part are based not merely upon the will of God, but upon the practical evidence of utility. Thus the old scriptural laws represent the best way, usually, of accomplishing a particular practical end here and now. The laws, therefore, relating to conduct are not arbitrary. They were not actually revealed in flames upon Sinai. They were gathered from the internal, subconscious experience of man from the beginning of his human existence, and gradually reduced through fable, myth, allegory, and legend into a code or series of statutes. Thus, when 
Certain religious observances are recommended for the home of man. It is because thousands of years have proven that homes where these principles are practiced are the better homes, the happier ones, the ones in which each member has the greatest liberty because he keeps the law. There is no liberty to be gained by breaking law because the moment you do, you come under the terrific burden of its censorship and of its inevitable reaction. So the Muslim, like most other ancient religions, put emphasis upon the niceness of human relationships, upon friendliness, courtesy, understanding, gentleness in family life, in which there was no allowance for irritation, for anger, for spite, for feuds, uh, for variously uh, cheating, wronging, and defrauding the members of families. And in the most Islamic countries, these laws are largely kept because there is no code apart from the religious code. In America, you can break many of these laws if you have a good lawyer and no witnesses. But in the East, you cannot, because you violate not man-made law first, but the code in your own heart first. And because that code is strong, you cannot endure it nor can you retain the respectability of your associates. And there is need for the reconstruction of these concepts in the integrities and values of life. There are many other things we can learn from Islam, and every enlightened Christian and every individual interested in the betterment of the world should read at least a good general outline of the Koran and its laws. He will find things there which he cannot use that belong to Arabia in the 6th and 7th centuries. But he will also find things that he can use. Reminders of integrity, ethics, and devotion which would be equally applicable to the members of every faith which will help him to appreciate that perhaps in the Koran he will find a statement that clarifies something for him which has been present in other faiths and in his own, but which he never quite saw that way or accepted in that light. And so from the general religious reading of the world, we become better informed. And being better informed, we are more suitable to practice brotherhood and to build this world into one constructive family, lighted by the sun of truth and preserved and protected by the great laws which have been revealed through many religions, but tell one story, the story of a divine plan which man must serve and which man must obey if he is to achieve the greatest security and peace of soul for himself and be of the greatest value and help to all others of his kind. Well, time's up.